Good afternoon. Where to get started, folks? We have, uh, we have limited time, so I want to make sure that, that we get started properly so that we have enough time for questions. Uh, welcome to the DACA and Immigration Town Hall at Santa Rosa Junior College. My name is Pedro Avila. I'm the Vice President of Student Services here at the college. Muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Pedro Avila. Yo soy el Vicepresidente de Servicios al Estudiante aquí en el Colegio de Santa Rosa. Le quiero dar la bienvenida a todos nuestros estudiantes, a nuestros padres y miembros de la comunidad. Please join me in welcoming U.S. Congressman Mike Thompson, Jerry Hoffman, and Jim Woods to Santa Rosa Junior College. Also, I just want to quickly recognize our Santa Rosa uh, staff and also the congressman staff for quickly working together to put this town hall together. Please give them a round of applause. Uh, I want to recognize the trustees that are here with us today. Uh, Trustee Dorothy uh, Benfeld. <laughs> Trustee Jordan Burns. and Trustee uh, Don Edgar. So to say, uh, as an immigrant myself, uh, this topic of immigration is very personal for me. At the age of nine, I, I came to this country. I moved from uh, Guadalajara, Mexico with my family. And uh, I can tell you that I can relate to my immigrant brothers and sisters. And it is very hurtful to, to hear the recent attacks on immigrants uh, so I can totally relate to, to my brothers and sisters. Here at Santa Rosa Junior College, we have over 1,500 undocumented students. And I am very proud to say that, thanks to our board and our college community, we have a safe haven uh, designation. This means that <laughs> this means that as a college, we are committed to serving protecting and making sure that students, regardless of their immigration status, feel welcome at Santa Rosa Junior College. Como emigrante, este tema de inmigración es algo muy personal para mí. A la edad de nueve años, yo emigré con mi familia a este país, y es difícil y me duele escuchar los recientes ataques contra emigrantes. Aquí en el Colegio de Santa Rosa, tenemos más de 1,500 estudiantes indocumentados, Y me da orgullo decir que aquí en el colegio es un lugar seguro, donde ellos son bienvenidos, protegidos, y reciben servicios sin importar su estatus legal. So before we begin, I just want to remind everyone that SRJC is committed to creating an environment free of harassment and discrimination. So please be very respectful with your comments and opinions. Now at this point, I'd like to introduce our, our town hall moderator, uh, Dr. Michael Hale is an English professor here at Santa Rosa Junior College. He's a graduate of Cal State Northridge and UCLA, where he earned uh, degrees in American Literature and Chicano and Central American Studies. He's kind of like a Latino, <laughs> but he's not. Uh, he's, uh, he has his PhD in American Cultural Studies. He's also the advisor of our Black Student Union in Mecha. He's a longtime social justice activist. He has an interest in, in racial justice and immigrant rights. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Huff. Thank you for that wonderful uh, introduction, and it's so good to see all these wonderful people here. This is one of the most pressing is issues of the 21st century. We have a full panel, and I will not take any time from our speakers. Um, after our presentations today, each of the speakers, the, the Congress people will take five minutes in presentations, and each of the remaining speakers will take three uh, minutes per speaker. Afterwards, we'll have a question and answer period. People from uh, the uh, Student Ambassadors Club will distribute cards. For those of you that feel nervous to speak, you can write out your question on that index card and pass it to one of the student ambassadors. People that would like to speak in front of the audience, 
There are, wire, there are wireless mics on each side of the audience. We'll ask at the end, at the conclusion of the, of the talks uh, to form orderly lines uh, on each side and to ask a question. We ask that you limit your question to one minute so that we can get as many questions as possible. With that in mind, let's welcome our first uh, panelist, and that will be Congressman Huffman, please. Thank you very much. That was my mistake. It is Congressman Thompson. I apologize about that. There my you mistake. go. Con Congressman Huffman. Oh, Con Congressman Thompson. I, I'm going to defer to the gentleman from uh, the other part of Sonoma County, Mike Thompson, to start first. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all very, very much for coming, and a special thanks to uh, Santa Rosa JC for hosting us today. Uh, this is an important issue, and to work with the uh, community and to work with the JC has been uh, just flawless, and everybody's on board and wants to make this work well. Thanks to all the panelists who are here. You've got a group of uh, folks who are experts uh, in this area. And uh, thank you for being here. This is a very important issue. Uh, when the president announced that he was going to end the DACA program, I think that uh, I'm sure you were every bit as surprised as the rest of us. Uh, not only is it mean-spirited, uh, not only is it insensitive, uh, but it hurts America and it hurts Americans. And make no mistake about it. Those in the DACA program and those who want to get in the DACA program are very important contributors to our everyday society. These are our friends, they're our neighbors, they're uh, students, they're professionals, they're military uh, service individuals. They are as American as any one of us in this room today. America is their country. This program, albeit not what I'd like to see, but this program allows them to stay here, to bring them out of the shadows, and continue to contribute uh, to their community and to our, our society uh, in, in a way that is important for all of us. I'm committed to fixing this. I'd like to see a different fix than just uh, the DACA, uh, but in the, in the interim, uh, DACA is extremely important. I'm all in for fixing it, and I'm interested in hearing what everyone here has to say. And I want to just um, make one, uh, one economic note. It is estimated that if DACA were to go away over the first 10 years, it would cost the American, American economy $460 billion. This is ludicrous. When we're talking about all the issues we have that we're dealing with, money is important. To leave this on the table is foolish beyond the foolishness of ending uh, DACA. So thanks for being here. I look forward to hearing what the panel has to say. Thank you so much. And now, Congressman Huffman, I do apologize. Not at all. Mistake. No problem. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Congressman Jared Huffman. It's great to be with all of you. Great to be with my colleague Mike Thompson, with Assembly Member Wood, and the other esteemed members of this panel. A big thank you to Santa Rosa Junior College for hosting us here today. Um, we're here to talk about something very important, and that is the need to protect uh, hundreds of thousands of young Americans, young DACA recipients. Uh, this is an understandably personal issue. I get that. I know there are many folks in this room who have been directly affected by the immigration issue in one form or another. Maybe uh, you are an undocumented community member, maybe uh, a DACA recipient, or uh, someone who has a friend or a family member who is. You may have also uh, experienced uh, the heartbreak and the disruption of deportation and what that can do to a family and to a neighborhood and to a community. Earlier this week, I was at an event in San Francisco with Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi. We had planned an event to show our support for the DREAM Act and for protecting DACA. Um, there were some very well-meaning protesters there who had a different idea of what we ought to be talking about, and uh, they took the stage and held it. And uh, I want you to know that I listened to them uh, and I'm sympathetic 
to, to many of the points that they made. Again, I understand how heartrending uh, and d really craven uh, deportation can be for so many people in this country. Uh, one of the things that the protesters were chanting was free Hugo Mejia. Hugo Mejia is my constituent. I've met with Hugo Mejia and his family. Uh, I've been to the rallies calling for uh, the end to this summary deportation of a good man who's a good father who's supporting his family, which includes two DACA recipients and one U.S. citizen, his children. One of his kids is the classmate of my own daughter at Terra Linda High School. I've uh, actually visited Hugo Mejia in jail, traveled to Sacramento to meet with him, uh, have worked closely with his legal team and with his family, and just last week introduced a bill to make him a U.S. citizen. I feel that strongly that this good American should not be deported and that we should be protecting him and his family. So, look, I understand there's a lot of concern out there, especially among some who see Democrats in Congress making a deal potentially with President Trump, who has been so hateful and so divisive and so difficult on these issues. I understand the anxiety and the concern, but I want you to know, at least speaking for myself, I'm guessing Mike Thompson feels the same way, uh, we're not interested in using immigrants as bargaining chips. Uh, just because we want to get the DREAM Act passed, because we want to protect several hundred thousand DACA registrants now, if we can do it on our terms, doesn't mean we don't care about all 11 million undocumented uh, people in this country. And so I want you to know that we don't support a crazy border wall. That's not gonna be part of the deal. We don't support some massive deportation force. That's not gonna be part of the deal. And we're gonna keep working it, with every resource we can bring to bear for comprehensive immigration reform so that we can address and help all 11 million folks in this country. I look forward to our conversation. Okay, at this time, Con Congressman Thompson will introduce the panelists. Or would you like me to? Why don't we go right down the line and just do, you, you wanna, just introduction, not for opening statements? Absolutely, I'm just following the Raphael, why don't we start with you and do self-introductions all the way down the line. My name is Rafael Vasquez. I've worked for Santa Rosa Junior College for about 20 years now. And part of what I do is provide services to undocumented students here. My name is Bernice Espinosa, and I am a deputy public defender. I am the immigration consequence specialist for the public defender's office. Mi nombre es Bernice Espinosa. Soy una de las defensoras públicas en el condado. Uh, yo me enfoco en cómo es que los casos criminales le puede impactar al estado inmigratorio. Hola, buenas tardes. Me llamo Leith Ocean. I am y soy el organizador Comunitario de la Organización la Unión de Jóvenes Inmigrantes de Norte de la Bahía. Hello everyone, my name is Leith Ocean, uh, but you can call me Leith. My gender pronouns are they, them, she, her, if that means anything to you. I am the coordinator or organizer for North Bay Immigrant Youth Union. Good afternoon, I'm Assemblymember Jim Wood. This is the southern part of my assembly district, which stretches all the way to the Oregon border. I'm happy to be here and uh, for this very important discussion. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Richard Kashnir. I'm an immigration attorney with a nonprofit in Santa Rosa called VIDAS, Vital Immigrant Defense Advocacy and Services, and I'll be talking to you in a few minutes about what we do. Good afternoon, my name is John McHugh, and I'm a local businessman here in Santa Rosa, and my company is Winning Workforce. Muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Alegría de la Cruz y soy una licenciada con el Condado de Sonoma. Good afternoon. My name is Alegría de la Cruz. I'm a Chief Deputy County Counsel with the County of Sonoma. And um, one of the things that I do for the county is coordinate our immigration pro bono work as well as the County Immigration Initiative. Uh, 
Thank you all. We will begin with Jim Wood, assembly member. Great. Thank you very much, and thanks for the opportunity to be here this afternoon. I'd also like to thank uh, Congressman Thompson, T Congressman Huffman for uh, being here and supporting this. I, for one, am very happy that they're in Washington, D.C., representing us. I'd also like to thank Dr. Chong for putting this together and for defending the rights of our undocumented students here at the junior college. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge and thank the Catholic Charities and the North Bay Organizing Project who are doing incredible work in our community, assisting and raising awareness on the issues of immigration. And lastly, <laughs> Lastly, I'd like to thank the, uh, the Sonoma County Co Office of Education, Santa Rosa City Schools, Santa Rosa Junior College, and all of the school districts in Sonoma County who were in the forefront in establishing safe haven schools to protect students from federal deportation efforts on school campuses. The Trump administration's decision to face out DACA, um, affecting 200,000 people in California, is troublesome to say the least. It's absolutely horrific, in my opinion. An estimated 6,000 DACA eligible young people who came here when they were children live in Sonoma County. Last Monday, the state of California filed a lawsuit against the federal government over its decision to end the DACA pro program. We are now among 18 other states that have done the same. To protect... To protect our young people, Governor Brown and the legislature recently budgeted $30 million to provide financial aid and legal services for DACA recipients. A portion of this money will be available to support nonprofits that contract with the state to help people apply or renew their DACA status. And, as, and last week, along with 57 of my colleagues in the assembly, we passed House Resolution 66, which sends a strong message to Washington that California State Assembly supports and will only support a comprehensive and workable approach to solving our nation's immigration system. I look forward to being a continued part of this dialogue and to do my part in Sacramento. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Rafael Velasquez, EOPS Outreach Coordinator here at Santa Rosa Junior College. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I have been working at Santa Rosa Junior College in the, in the position as a coordinator for the last 13 years. And one of the things that I found out when I started in that position is that Santa Rosa Junior College, unfortunately, was not very much aware of a law that was passed on October 12 of 2001, which allowed undocumented students to come to Santa Rosa Junior College and attend any of the 113 community colleges, CSUs, and UCs. So one of the first things that we did was to you know, mobilize and create uh, flyers, educate our, our high schools, junior high schools and elementary schools, and we started doing outreach. Um, as of 2015, now we have a dream center that although if you visit it, it's in Plover Hall, it's small in size at the moment, but there's planning and there's a process to make it into a larger welcoming space with confidential space for our volunteer attorney who comes over a couple of, once a, a month, excuse me, to provide legal um, consultations to our students. We also have, um, I oversee about 553 emails that goes to the students on a weekly basis to update them on scholarships. And we have been providing services to students over the last several years. So when President Obama signed the executive order to create DACA, immediately we mobilized, we went and we learned from the experts on how to fill out DACA applications. And to, at the last record, we have done about 553 DACA applications first time and over 600 renewals. And if in the, these students, who again, many of them are low income, if they had gone to do these applications at $500 per application with a private attorney, um, when you think about it, we have saved these students and this community about half a million dollars by just doing this service. And the way we see it at Santa Rosa, <laughs> 
the way we see it at Santa Rosa Junior College is again, we are a community college and therefore it's our social responsibility to provide services to our community and we are grateful to have the opportunity to do that. Um, recently we just did live after DACA, which was a couple of weeks ago, and we had over 300 members of the community. Uh, Bernice Espinosa was there to provide legal information, and then uh, Mr. Rich Koshner and a couple of other attorneys volunteered their time to do an immigration clinic. We will be doing another immigration clinic this Saturday at the Southwest Center of Santa Rosa Junior College at 950 South Wright Road, please contact our office, 707-521-6934, if you would like uh, a free consultation with one of our volunteer attorneys. Thank you for your time. Rafael, would you like to share the Facebook information where they can stay updated? People are welcome to check out our Facebook page. It's called DACA Sonoma County. And there we are updating information on a regular basis. We verify the information that we are providing. As an example, last night we were contacted that immigration was in Santa Rosa. So <clears throat> I got up and I went out there, drove around for 45 minutes around Santa Rosa looking for immigration. Couldn't find it, therefore we don't provide that information unless it's verified. DACA, Sonoma County. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Laith Ocean, a DACA recipient and an SRJC student. I'm going to take a moderator privilege. Laith was a student of mine, and I can't be more proud of him. I, I'm, my position as an English teacher here, but you have really been my teacher on this issue. And I, I really encourage all students to come up and, and meet um, Laith afterwards and really see him as a model student and a model activist. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone, again, my name is Laith, gender pronouns are them, she, her, if that means anything to you. Uh, I'm an undocumented, unafraid, queer, trans, unashamed, and unapologetic. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm the organizer from North Bay Immigrant Youth Union, and along with other folks here uh, present, um, we, along with other folks throughout California, during California, we planned uh, the protest or event that happened uh, on Monday at Pelosi's uh, press release. And I, like we said, uh, we're gonna be present at every single congressperson's uh, press release uh, whenever they speak to hold them continuously accountable and demand transparency. Um, and, then, and to tell you a little bit my story, um, one of all, one, first of all, um, I'm not a dreamer, so please don't call me one. And my story isn't beautiful. And migration is displacement and deportation is ethnic, is ethnic cleansing. So when y'all want to say migration is beautiful, please remind yourselves that I crossed five borders because the US came to my country and displaced us. <laughs> Democrats, I stand with the immigrant liberation movement and we are the resistance to Trump. We are the cause, not you. Uh, and we undocumented youth will demand a clean bill, a bill that will further, uh, a bill that will not further criminalize us, our communities, or our families. And just to remind you all, the border is already militarized. We don't need any more dead bodies there. <laughs> and as y'all has said, um, that you won't support any bill that will further criminalize us that will further allocate funds to criminalize us or to programs that will use, be used for our deportation. I will hold you all both accountable and I will hold the rest of the entire government accountable for those words. Thank you. Somebody handed me, somebody handed me a note. Uh, our next speaker will be Alegria de la Cruz, Chief Deputy <clears throat> County Councils, County of Sonoma. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much for the opportunity to represent Sonoma County today. 
Um, I'm proud to be a public servant in these times where um, we both have a very clear responsibility and a clear role that local governments can play in, in these strange times. <laughs> Our board has taken every opportunity to show leadership and to take action that we do everything we can to represent and serve all people in Sonoma County with special attention to those folks in our community who are at increased risks because of changes in federal policy. Our board has entered this issue thoughtfully and with the help and advice from our community, um, really beginning in November. We convened legal service partners, we conducted an analysis of resources available in our community, and we asked our departments internally that serve this immigrant community what was happening with people's enrollment in important services to ensure their health and safety and welfare um, during these times. We found that our nonprofit organizations, while mighty and doing amazing work in our community, are under-resourced and significantly and severely under-resourced to provide the kind of legal services that are needed at this time. And so we launched with partners in the private and philanthropic centers, the Sonoma County Secure Families Fund. And this is a wonderful opportunity for not only the county, but all of the cities located in our jurisdictions, for folks in the private sector, for folks in the nonprofit sector to come together. And the goal is to raise $2 million over the next three years and that will go to provide very important legal service resources to those folks who need them most at this time. Um, we're working to, to raise funds throughout the county and um, we're also holding resource fairs in each of the districts in the county, um, hosted by the county supervisors and with county departments to ensure that folks who have fallen out of um, enrollment in very important pro and very important benefit programs like WIC, like CalWORKs, um, that folks have an opportunity to re-enroll and to know that those services have not changed and folks' eligibility for those services have not changed. And that our county will do everything that we can to make sure that people's private information remains private. Um, we are working um, tonight, actually, in Petaluma at the Lucchese Community Center. Supervisor David Rabbit is hosting a resource fair that begins at 6 o'clock tonight. Um, county departments will be there. Our, our wonderful partners in the nonprofit um, industry will be there to provide free legal consultation, free um, DACA renewal help if needed, and with information and financial resources for folks who need help with those renewal fees. Um, we're also partnering with the Sonoma County Office of Education to provide a legal clinic this Saturday from 1 to 4 at Cook Middle School. So if you can't make it to Rafa's event on Saturday morning, come on over to Cook Middle School. And some of the wonderful folks who are helping out on Saturday morning will be shuttling right over to Cook Middle School to help out on Saturday afternoon. Um, we know that this deadline puts um, a lot of intense kind of need in our community, and all of the people here are doing everything that we can to make sure that that need is met. Um, we are also having our last community resource fair on the 28th, um, hosted by County uh, Supervisor Shirley Zane, and that's gonna be held on Thursday the 28th from 6 p.m. on at uh, the Kiwana Springs Elementary. So we are available for help, questions, um, and any other resources that might be provided, feel free to reach out at immigration at sonoma-county.org. Si se puede. Force. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Congressman Thompson, Congressman Huffman, Assembly Member Wood, and ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been in the human resource business for the last 38 years, and for the last 23, I've been uh, the founder and CEO of Winning Workforce. What we do is we tutor business clients on how to interview effectively and then use PXT Select assessments to bridge the gap between the resume and the interview. In Sonoma County, the unemployment rate is under 4%. When I talk to clients and I talk to others, one of the things that I hear is, we can't find any qualified candidates. And when you dig into that question a little bit, what they're really saying is that they can't find candidates with integrity, reliability, and work ethic. Now we have an untapped resource, and it is you, DACA representative. 
because you have been through the mother of investigations. Most of us will never have to endure what you've endured. You have already demonstrated your reliability, your integrity, and your work ethic. The challenge is, how do we get you in front of business owners who want to hire you? How do we do that? Perhaps a job fair. I don't know, but that's the challenge, I think, that we need to really work on. One of the things I believe in is that here in now is where our life is. And so how can we make our situation the best that it can be? And I think having you as a resource known in the community benefits us all. Next, we have Bernice Espinosa, Deputy Public Defender, Sonoma County. So most of you are probably wondering, why is there a public defender at this table? Well, I can explain that. In 2010, there was... <laughs> in 2010, there was a case by the U.S. Supreme Court called Kentucky versus Padilla that said, hey, criminal defense attorney, you need to let a, a person who is not a U.S. citizen know how their criminal case is going to impact their immigration status. And if you don't, we can take away your bar card. Now the problem is that f immigration is federal law and our criminal code is state law. And so it's really hard as public defenders to know all of the things for our state and then also all the immigration. But um, I have a boss who had a lot of insight and realized that there needed to be someone that all of the other public defenders could come to and ask those questions. And in, it was in 2015 that she asked our Board of Supervisors to have a position to do that. But I also have, we are only one out of seven counties in the state that does have an in-house immigration specialist. I have a very unique situation in that we see people at their uh, most vulnerable moments. And um, I want to give you a story about an individual and um, really discussing some of these issues that we may not think about when we talk about DACA. I had a client, um, well, there was assigned to another attorney who was, we were working on this case. And this person was a young, a young man and had been kicked out of his home after he came out of the closet. Um, he was brought here thinking that he was going to go visit Disneyland for the first time. Um, he lets us know he still has never been to Disneyland. But being queer, being undocumented, and having no job security, um, he took the advice of some people that took advantage of him and said, hey, you know, there's this abandoned property. You could, um, you could harvest some marijuana here, and, um, and that would keep your livelihood. Well, that particular situation would mean it would be an aggravated felony, which means he could actually face up to 20 years in federal prison if he was deported and then tried to return. He'd been here since he was only four years old. But he was DACA eligible. And we worked with um, the district attorney's office and the other parties in order to make sure that he could get his eligibility. Um, my role here is to help all of you who may have had interactions with law enforcement. Under the current administration, you are particularly vulnerable. The Trump administration has said that those who have even been accused, not even just with convictions, but cases dismissed, um, are a priority for removal. So for all individuals who are not US citizens, who've had interactions with law enforcement and would like to have advice, my office is here to serve you. Coming to our last speaker on the panel, so what I want to encourage people to do is if you would like to ask a question on a card, there'll be cards circulated around the audience. At the conclusion of this next speaker, I'll ask, I'll, if people would like to ask a question, I would, I would ask for two orderly lines. On, on each side, there's a microphone there and there's a microphone there. Our last speaker today is Richard, Richard Koshner, an immigration attorney uh, with VDES. 
Good afternoon, and thank you to the organizers. Um, I was asked to speak about how our organization, VDAS, uh, can be of benefit to DACA grantees and vice versa, how DACA grantees can be of benefit to our work. Um, we provide legal advice and consultations to any immigrants who come to us with questions, questions about their current condition and questions about how they might improve their immigration status, go from permanent resident to citizen or from undocumented to permanent resident or other improvements of status. So we can provide those to DACA grantees. And if we determine that a DACA grantee is eligible for some form of improvement of status, we can represent you in that process. We can also represent your parents and siblings and other family members, which is really key. And I, at this point, I really want to say thank you to Congressman Huffman for his words about the concern for all 11 million. I, I am hearing DACA grantees saying to the world, we don't care just about ourselves. We also care about our parents, our older brothers and sisters, our uncles and aunts, and so on. We do representation of people who are in deportation. And uh, that would include you DACA grantees, your family members, and others. And we try to do that at as low a cost as possible. We're setting our fees at a break-even rate. We're very grateful to the county for its fundraising and uh, subsidi subsidization of deportation defense for uh, folks who live here in Sonoma County. On the other side, um, we have a, a, a grassroots community organization called Comité Vida. It's not really part of our nonprofit, but is a sister organization. And it does organizing and mobilizing for actions to demand greater rights. So not just legal services to win the rights that you have, but also organizing to demand better rights. Um, and we invite DACA grantees to be part of that or to work with Leith's organization, North Bay Immigrant Youth Union, but liaison with us to see how we can support NBIYU in its work. Now, you may be familiar with uh, Mother Jones and her slogan upon her impending death, don't mourn, organize. We would say organize, organize, organize. To demand the DREAM Act that I think is being proposed in Congress, but also remedies for the parents and others. Uh, a couple of things that could be done in short order. There is a cap for the number of U visas that can be given in a given year, and that's 10,000. But I'm told that there are uh, approximately 70,000 applications pending. Now, U visas are for the people who've been the victims of crime, generally violent crime. Republicans should be sympathetic to people who are victims of violent crime. And we should increase that cap. There's no reason why people should be waiting three to four years to get a U visa. And then finally, there's a cap of 4,000 for people to win cancellation of removal from an immigration judge. But to win it, you have to prove that your US citizen child would suffer exceptional and extremely unusual hardship if you, the parent, are deported. Well, why should we be capping that at 4,000? If you can prove that, you should win. And there shouldn't be any waiting period. There shouldn't be any cap of 4,000. So we should enact these changes as soon as possible. Thanks. OK, thank you. Wonderful panel. Uh, I'm going to ask that people now line up uh, if they would like to speak a question. Line up on each side. If we could also uh, try to, I want to encourage students as well. I know many of you are probably nervous. I want to encourage the young people in the audience, I want to encourage the students here uh, to feel that this is your opportunity to, to speak to uh, this panel. I also want to encourage undocumented voices here. Many of you cannot vote, so this is your opportunity to, to petition uh, representatives. While uh, we're waiting for people to line up and we're collecting cards, I have one card here, and this is a question for the congressman. Would you consider attaching the DREAM Act of 2017 H.R. 3440 to any legislation that is considered must pass? Well, I, I think it needs to pass as a standalone bill. Uh, and I'm not certain uh, who's defining 
must pass. So uh, I suspect that uh, if you were to ask the President of the United States, he would tell you that a bill authorizing a wall to be built on our southern border would be a must pass piece of legislation. And I'm here to tell you it's not, and I certainly wouldn't uh, allow it, I wouldn't support attaching it to that. But I want to uh, do whatever we can to make sure that uh, the DACA program remains intact and at the same time um, want to be able to uh, not preclude our efforts or hamper our efforts to deal with comprehensive immigration uh, reform uh, as a whole. So when, when we talk about must pass legislation, an example, at the end of this month, the authorization for the FAA uh, expires. Congress must extend that authorization or the FAA ceases to be able to function. We're not going to let that happen. So there's a must-pass opportunity for legislation to reauthorize the FAA. Would I try to attach the DREAM Act to that? Sure. I mean, I would be delighted to be allowed to add an amendment that couples the DREAM Act to the FAA reauthorization. The parliamentarian in Congress will rule that not germane and out of order. But it's the kind of thing that I, I certainly would look for opportunities to do. So I guess the short answer is yes, if there's any logical hitching of the DREAM Act to something else, I'm happy to try. The best hope is probably the omnibus government funding legislation. We have about two and a half months to go before that comes up, um, and the DREAM Act would fit nicely into that if we're allowed to do it. We should try. Okay, excellent. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, I'm going to first move here, then I'm going to move here, and then I'm going to go to a card, and we'll follow that routine. Please keep your comment to one minute, and I'll time it. I'll just tap the microphone uh, when it reaches a minute. Thank you. Right over here. Can everyone hear me? Um, I want to thank the entire panel for being here to address this really important issue. I know you all have very busy schedules. My name is Todd. I'm the proud father of Zoe Carroll who um, won her, the writing award for her college, Oaks College at UC, UC Santa Cruz, for the letter she sent to Congressman Huffman. And I want to thank you, Congressman Huffman, for sending a, a very lengthy, in-depth, robust response to her. Thank you. So first, I have a comment. I don't know if anyone has ever listened to Mark Maron's podcast, but uh, recently, Kathy Bates was uh, speaking. And she was somewhat nervous in talking, but at the end she had an agenda, and that was to talk about um, something from Shakespeare, and that basically to paraphrase what she said, that rational mercy has to win out over hostile, irrational, power-mongering, and bullying. It just has to win. We'll all benefit from that. Um, and then my question is, are, is there an effort, uh, and what effort is there to, um, encourage people that are DACA representatives, recipients, grantees, whatever, um, to get their work permits renewed as soon as possible. So, I'm not no one in particular, just uh, it, it seems like it's one of the ways people can protect So, um, this actually affects a number of us. A number of us are actually part of a team. Uh, at the county level, and so uh, we have Rick Koshner from Vidas, but um, we also have Rafael here from the uh, Vasquez from the, the JC, and different county partners who have actually come to do Know Your Rights information. So the renewal process, there, um, if you currently have a DACA um, work authorization that expires between September 5th, 2017 and March 5th, 2018, you may renew your, your card. However, you have to turn in your renewal by October 5th. For that reason, we do have a number of different clinics that are happening, and I'll leave it open to the other um, speakers. Uh, in order to do your renewal process. Um, we also are trying to make sure that we have loans and other um, funding available because it is expensive. It's $445 a person. However, I'm sorry? 495, I've been corrected. Um, and the, um, 
there is a very short period of time also if you've had any kind of contact with law enforcement before you renew please make sure that you come and speak to my office um, or with an immigration attorney not a notario about how that can impact your status so there are resources available however unfortunately individuals who have work authorizations that expire after March 5th will not be able to renew thank you okay and just very question. quickly if so I may just just a follow-up. There are flyers outside on the table there when you signed up um, that have all the information about the county um, clinics that are happening before September 29th, which is really the last day that you should get that renewal application in the mail in order for it to be received on October 5th. And I'm also happy to announce the County Board of Supervisors um, recommended to the new Sonoma County Secure Families Fund to make $10,000 available for $250 grants to people who um, can demonstrate need to help with those DACA renewal fees. So there's additional resources available in the county on top of the Mexican consulate's announcement that it will help all Mexican nationals with, um, with full fee payment. Um, and there's a number of other resources in our community that will be available to you at these um, county clinics and also at the JC this, um, this Saturday morning. Very quickly, just um, Santa Rosa Junior College, again, we have our Dream Center. So if there's anybody in the community, uh, we have a young individual, Hector Jimenez Carreño, who is here working Monday through Friday to do DACA renewals. So please call 707-521-7947, 707-521-7947. If you would like to schedule a renewal, again, instead of paying somebody to do the paperwork for you, we do it for free, and then you just have to come up with the 495. For students who are undocumented at Santa Rosa Junior College, we're always looking for funds, and we have received a little bit of money, so we are looking at giving a few scholarships of about $200, and for anybody out there in the community, we're happy to take your donations at the Undocumented Student Union at Santa Rosa Junior College. Okay, so we have uh, just 15 minutes left, so let's, uh, let's keep the questions for Okay, awesome. Um, mine's more of a statement than a question. Hi, guys. My name is Jane Alexandra Delian. I was born in Manila, Philippines, and was brought to this country when I was only three years old. I am a DACA student, and I am a proud American. My entire education has been in America, having attended kindergarten through 12th grade in California. I am currently in my third year at the College of Marin, where I'm studying political science. I have worked as a student ambassador in my college for over a year, and I'm an active member of our honor society. I plan to transfer to UC Santa Barbara in the fall of 2018, and after completing my undergrad, I am hoping to attend law school to help, to help serve marginalized and underrepresented communities, especially immigrants. I wanted to share my story today to show that I am just like you. I'm smart, I'm strong, I'm hardworking, I speak English, <laughs> and I have dreams and aspirations that I hope to achieve one day. One common misconception about dreamers is that there's not too many of us that we're hard to find. Well, I am here to say that your classmate is a dreamer, your lawyer is a dreamer, your doctor is a dreamer, your boss is a dreamer. We are all around and we are here to stay. But, <laughs> thanks. Please wrap up. Yeah. But before I end my speech, I'd just like to address the undocumented youth that protested leader Nancy Pelosi's support for DREAM Act press event on Monday. Laith, you're awesome, and I hope that you'll see where I'm coming from. I understand why you are angry. I know firsthand what it's like to have a loved one deported, to have them ripped out of your life. I know the pain and the suffering and the anger that comes with all of it. And I understand how nothing that Congressman Huffman or Leader Pelosi or any Democrat, what, at, what, how anything that they do can seem like it's not good enough. But I'm here to tell you, my undocumented brothers and sisters, that for right now, under this president, under this Republican Congress, the DREAM Act is what we need. Now, I'm no politician, but if we can get the DREAM Act passed, and protect nearly 800,000 young Americans, then we can work towards winning the next Congress, winning the next presidency, 
allowing us to actually have the political power to protect the rest of our other 11 million brothers and sisters. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Can I, uh, can I, can I interject with a, just full, full disclosure, full disclosure, Alex is not only an inspiring young dreamer, she not only has the good sense to be transferring to UC Santa Barbara, my alma mater, <laughs> uh, she also was an amazing intern in my congressional office, and that's how we got to know her. So thank you, Alex, for sharing your story. That's fun. Thank you. Hi, uh, so I just really want to acknowledge you for first speaking. Uh, and second, uh, I want to appreciate uh, you coming forward and your experiences also. I don't want to devalue that. However, um, I do want to call into question. Um, Democrats in general have created a deportation machine that is now out of control and was later handed over to Trump. And my concern now is how many more people will be deported? Will my parents be deported? Will my friends who aren't in, in college, who aren't able to intern uh, a congressman's uh, lobby or whatever, uh, will they be deported, right? And while I, I appreciate you and um, I value you and, and, I, and I, I want you to stay here, I also want other folks to stay here as well. So now I'm going to read from a card, then I'll move over there, then I'll move back here. So this is to Congressman Thompson. You mentioned that those who have DACA are important uh, contributors and just as American as anyone else. I agree. But what about my mom, my uncle, my aunt, my cousins? Are they not important because they don't qualify for DACA? What about the other 11 million? The other 11 million are very important as well. Uh, this town hall meeting is on DACA, and that's why I preferenced uh, uh, that, uh, the, the, that program. But uh, we need to do, as I said uh, later, uh, we need to focus our attention on comprehensive immigration reform. I would just like to acknowledge that um, this is not common. Uh, we have members here from the local level of government, from the state, and from the federal government. And this is not the first time we've convened in order to protect immigrants. Our county has supported SB 54 and AB 3 and SB 6, although those did not go through. Um, that had to do a lot with what the work of uh, uh, Mr. Wood, uh, Assembly Woods is doing. And um, we have been invited to talk on more broadly on immigration issues by both congressmen before in Petaluma, and I want to thank them for their leadership in that. I'll also, I'll also note that I was incorrect about the time, so we have uh, quite a bit of time, more than 30 minutes now. So. <laughs> Um, so I guess just a, a comment on what you said um, as, as far as DACA, right, and, and this being specifically about DACA, um, i just like to again acknowledge that now that DACA is gone, it is time for us to look beyond DACA and to move further from DACA. Um, that includes this conversation. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hector Jimenez Carreño. I am actually here a part of the Dream Center on campus. Uh, but other than that, I also wanted to clear up because I was also yesterday, or pardon me, yesterday, yesterday was Monday, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, at the Pelosi event. Uh, and just to clear things up, we were asking for a clean dream act. And that essentially means that we don't want, uh, you know, further militarization of the border, as well as we don't want our parents to be criminalized because I don't think anybody would, right? Uh, there's always this talk about um, compromising, right? Uh, but I personally, I don't see how Compromising my parents is, is a just thing to do. Uh, but other than that, right, uh, what I also wanted to mention or my question is, uh, what can we do about mental health, right? I personally, I work at the Dream Center. And a lot of the things that have been uh, occurring is that, you know, students, uh, community members and things like that are very anxious. And this is also causing a lot of depression. I have personally have had to deal with a lot of individuals who have come to me seeking resources or just wanted to talk. And a lot of them have contemplated do, uh, you know, committing suicide. So how can we assist these individuals so that this does not occur? Um, you know, what, what steps can we take? Uh, what, can we process something through here through the JC or through other community colleges and so on and so forth? That would be my question. I'll take the first part of it. So at Santa Rosa Junior College, we had a meeting actually just yesterday 
to make sure that psychological services that are going to be specifically targeted to this population will be made available. In fact, there's a, a first a group meeting uh, that is gonna happen right after this event. And we did it on purpose where we're gonna bring a therapist. The space is only for undocumented students. So everybody else, we appreciate that you might wanna be of service, but the space will be only for undocumented students starting at 3 p.m. today. And then what we are wanting to do is on a weekly basis, we wanna provide a space that is gonna be safe and welcoming to all uh, our undocumented students on campus. And so we have psychological services that will be providing these services both in English and in Spanish for students to be able to do uh, group work. And then our psychological services department will be welcoming and continue to welcome students to receive psychological services Monday through Friday at 1.30 in the afternoon, they check in and by two in the afternoon, they can receive services and there are emergency services as well. And in our community, we have a nonprofit organization called Humanidad by uh, Dr. Maria Hess that provides services with an emphasis specifically on the Latino, Latina, Latinx community. And at the same time, these services are bilingual. So we wanna make sure that, again, as you are thinking about where to do a donation, people say, I don't know what to do about this issue of immigration besides coming to this type of events. There's nonprofit organizations like Humanidad that are always needing our economic assistance. Thank you. If I, if I could just add one thing. Um, mental health services in our country are woefully insufficient. I, I don't think anybody would argue with that. But there's something happening in Washington, D.C. right now that would exacerbate that. And so here comes your assignment, your homework assignment. I want everybody here to call both Senator Feinstein and Senator Harris when, we, when you leave here today and let them know that we cannot allow the Republican Party to repeal the Affordable Care Act. That would <laughs> deliver a terrible blow to mental health. Thank you, Congressman. Um, just another addition there, the, um, the county resource fairs that are being held tonight in Petaluma and next Thursday at Kiwana Springs Elementary will both have um, the county health department available to re-enroll people if they've fallen out or to help people figure out how to access services if they don't um, find themselves eligible. So we have eligibility workers there available with information. Please come. Um, also, uh, for a lot of us undocumented folks, we don't have insurance, and there are other ways that we can get mental health. However, uh, some of us can't work either um, because our work permits are being taken away. Uh, this is a great moment for allies to really step up and help us with our mental health as we're trying to survive uh, in, in this country. Um, so y'all can help in that way. Thank you. I was going to actually address that. North Bay Organizing Project uh, put on a, a health, um, alternative health, acupuncture, massage, breathing, um, the, right after the DACA, um, life after DACA. And so we do have individuals uh, here. If you want more information, you can come speak to us. North, or, North Bay Organizing Project is one of our community partners. I want to emphasize that the campus-based psychological services are free, and they're right across the, the street there in Clover Hall. Good afternoon. I'm Janice Cater Thompson, um, Petaluma. And I just want to talk about, or get some answers, on what our representatives are doing after um, what happened with Nancy Pelosi um, in San Francisco. And do you have a dialogue with the DACA um, who, folks that were there? What are you going to be doing so this doesn't continue happening? and how we can actually talk about why they were there protesting. And I heard a young man make a comment why he was there, but is there dialogue with the representatives, with the group that was there to, to deal with this before it continues happening? Because I hate to see, I mean, this country is just falling apart. There's such a divide. And in my lifetime, I never thought I would see this divide, and then I don't want to see it with like-minded people. So is there anything? Um, also, if y'all need a reminder, I do have all the list of demands that folks had on Monday. Okay, so Janice, thanks for the question. I was there too. And uh, 
You asked about dialogue. Well, we're here right back at it again uh, with a public event open to everyone, including, in fact, we really hope uh, as many DACA uh, recipients as possible are here today and will participate. We invited Lake to be on this panel, uh, knowing that he's a, not only DACA recipient, but actually was one of the protesters that shut down the Pelosi event on Monday. So I think there's a real desire to keep talking and to have that dialogue. My only disappointment about the way things went down Monday, and I can't speak for Leader Pelosi, she has her own relationships with her constituents who were part of that group, was that there was no room for dialogue. Uh, we could have had a great conversation because I will just tell you, Barbara Lee and I and, and Leader Pelosi were, were sitting there as, as these demands were being articulated saying, you know, we agree with a lot of this. We want to talk to you about this. Every time we tried, we were sort of shouted down with Democrats, our deporters, and chants like that. So look, I get the passion. We really do. Uh, I understand how ugly deportation is and what it does to people in their lives. But I think you're exactly right, Janice. We've got to keep having the dialogue. And I think it's important for everyone to understand that for those who want not just to protect the 800,000 DACA recipients, but the full 11 million uh, among us, Democrats are your best hope of doing that right now. So let's work together. Thank you for your service. To a card question, um, I'm assuming that this is a, a, a directed towards the congressman. Please discuss impeachment. <laughs> I, I feel like the mechanism is in place for this exact situation. Please don't be shy about talking about this with your colleagues in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Well, I'm of the school that this president is going to self-impeach. Um, <laughs> The best thing that we can do at this point is to allow Justice Mueller to uh, continue his work. Uh, he gets deeper and deeper uh, into things uh, as the days go by. Uh, you're starting to see uh, some indictments coming up. Uh, I think that uh, we've, we're going to have a lot to learn. Uh, as of today, I don't think there's anything uh, not, I, let me rephrase that. <clears throat> I don't think there's uh, anything that's been proven uh, that is an impeachable uh, offense. Uh, how it plays out, I don't know. But I think, uh, I think uh, uh, Justice Mueller needs to continue his work. And when that's done, we'll know where we go from there. Uh, the other half of this congressional duo here, uh, I certainly agree that Bob Mueller cannot finish his work fast enough for the country and for the world. Uh, I may have a little bit of a different take. I'm, I'm one out of 435 members of the House of Representatives. I've seen more than enough to convince me that there are grounds for impeachment. But, and uh, whether that involves the, the lies, the non-disclosures, the Russia issues, the emoluments clause, the abuse of power, the obstruction of justice, I mean, I could sort of write up those articles of impeachment almost, it'd be kind of a fun exercise actually right now. <laughs> We'd all feel better. Uh, however, uh, I can't get you the votes to start an impeachment inquiry because you gotta get to 218 for that to actually start happening. We've only got uh, 190 and change in Democrats. And so the, the truth is, it's better for the country when you get to this extraordinary possibility of impeachment, it's always better for the country that that be bipartisan so that America understands that when it happens, it's never a partisan stunt. It's something that's really important institutionally to our democracy. But it's also just a function of math. It's going to have to be bipartisan. So I think Mike is exactly right. The Mueller process, the investigations, the scrutiny from the media and from the public is all going to have to take this thing to a higher level. Whether Donald Trump is still president, when we get to that point, we'll see. If he's not, though, and if we can get to 218, I'll be glad to support impeachment. Hi, my name is Vidi Agapov, and this is more of a comment than a question. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank um, uh, the college for putting an event like this one together. And although I wasn't at the rally on Monday, I just wanted to say to uh, Leif um, 
that um, I first and foremost admire and respect um, you guys for putting yourselves out there and getting their, your message across. It isn't easy as it looks to go up against power and structures, but sometimes we have to. For, from what I, I could tell, um, I do believe that the original message was to the man a clean Dream Act bill uh, without border security, security measures, as was rumored to be part um, from the deal last week. And, um, but I think the message got lost um, later. Um, but in any case, as long as folks are able to reach out to Pelosi at Pelosi's office, to clarify uh, their message, I think the direct action did its intended job. And so I, I wanted to say thank you to you and to the organizers. Um, and uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yes, just to clarify, you are correct. We were demanding a Clean Dream Act bill. Um, Again, if anybody would like to look at our specific demands, I do have all the demands that we chanted on Monday. Uh, and we have continuously been reaching out to Pelosi still, um, who still hasn't talked to us and doesn't want to meet with us. But um, we are open to all communications with both of y'all um, and with anybody else who would like to speak with us um, about how to move forward and how we can incorporate our demands uh, with everything that y'all are doing. OK. Um, I'm given a card here reminding that uh, to be mindful of the pronouns that Leith asked, that, uh, uh, that, it be re that Leith be referred to as she or her or they or them from the speakers and from the host. Thank you. Over here. Buenas, <coughs> Buenas tardes, tardes, todas, 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 todos. Uh, my name is Alexander Gonzalez Jimenez. I am a student here at the SRJC and I am a member of Mitch at SRJC. I am here speaking on my own as an ally for all undocumented folks, Latino, Latina, Latinx, Blacks, trans and queers, Muslim, and all other undocumented folks. I also went on Monday to protest against Nancy Pelosi because my friends, my family, my community are not bargaining chips. Today, I am here as a student, as a friend, as a family member, requesting demands to our representative members and to my campus VP and President Dr. Chong. I am here asking, rather demanding to my community college to educate and create more safe spaces for all undocumented folks where they can feel safe and protected and, give, and for our representative to give an example to other campuses and colleges, however, not excluding our elementaries and middle and high schools. I am asking you all, what will you do and how will you do it, or rather, will you not? Is this directed towards someone specific? I, I think we hear you. Uh, and I guess I would just ask back, uh, if there's anything more you think we should do, mm -hmm. tell us. Because uh, you're looking at two members of Congress that are co-sponsors of comprehensive immigration reform to address the whole 11 million, that are co-sponsors of a Clean Dream Act, that would like nothing better than to protect everyone in our communities that have pulled together forums with uh, local law enforcement and local government leaders to make sure that we are sending the message loud and clear that uh, we don't want deportation forces in our community. We don't want our local governments or our local cops to be immigration enforcers. So we're trying to do everything we can think of. I think we're on the same page here, but if there's more you think we should do, please tell us. Uh, this is a follow-up to that. Um, what I'm uh, kind of more suggesting is, how can you all help our campuses, our universities, um, implement safe spaces for undocumented folks who we know for a fact that ICE will not respect their uh, policies and may or sooner, sooner or later they will invade our campuses and will create um, fear amongst all undocumented folks. All I can tell you is that I have been in meetings where the gentleman next to me, Mike Thompson, took the Homeland Security Secretary directly to task on this very point. 
challenging him about whether ICE folks were going to churches and to schools and hospitals and courtrooms and other places that the community needs to know are safe places. So uh, we are doing everything that we can. We're in the minority in Congress, uh, so it's a bit of a defensive uh, position, but with every uh, resource we can muster, we're, we're fighting exactly that fight. Let me just add, <laughs> let, let me just add, I, I agree with, uh, Congressman Huffman, he's, uh, he's spot on. And when we say we're doing everything we can, we're doing everything we can. Uh, not only did I take on uh, now Chief of Staff Kelly, uh, then Secretary of Homeland Security Kelly, uh, because of the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, police logo that ICE wears on their jersey. Uh, how that is not only um, inappropriate uh, for, uh, for ICE to be doing that, but it's, it's creating a public safety problem in our community. Uh, for years, uh, our local law enforcement has been building relationships amongst the, uh, immigrate, uh, the immigrant population, immigrant community, and that, that's, that relationship is pretty solid. Uh, and now they see these guys showing up with police logos on, and they're, they're beginning to question how well they should work with law enforcement. They think ICE and the police are, are, are the same thing. But when immigration, uh, comprehensive immigration reform uh, failed in, in Congress, a bunch of us got together, and we, we didn't say, well, uh, we're, we're, we're dead in the water, we're not going to go any further. We developed a strategy where we'd break it up take pieces of that comprehensive bill and introduce it as standalone legislation to see if we could if we if we could you know crack the armor uh, in this uh, in the in the opposition and I'm the author I'm still the author of one of those bills and that's to provide uh, uh, better services for uh, undocumented who are in the military and their family. So we're trying from every angle, standalone bills, comprehensive bills, DACA bills, whatever it might be, any way that we can insert ourselves into this uh, issue uh, to be able to uh, eventually get to where I think everybody here wants to get, and that's uh, comprehensive immigration reform. And I'd just like to add, certainly from the state level, uh, in California, we have been very aggressive in pushing back against this administration and supporting our members of Congress and supporting our senators. And we will continue that until this oppression, until this oppressive administration either moves along, which we all hope is going to happen soon, or, or, or practices change. But it is important to us in the state legislature that we protect everyone who lives in California, regardless of how they got here, and, 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 and regardless of the color of their skin, it doesn't matter. This is home for, for all of us here. We have to do everything we can to protect that, and we will continue to support our members of Congress and, and until, we, until we're successful. Just to follow up on what Bernice had mentioned earlier, the fact that you've got folks at the kind of county level, I know we've got city folks out there. I saw Jack Tibbetts, our vice mayor of Santa Rosa. Um, we've got city, county, state, and federal representatives here all sitting together, and we are providing a united front to make sure that we all are doing everything that we can to make sure that we represent every single person who lives in our community, who's a part of our community. The fact that Sonoma County was the first county in the state to come out in support of controversial SB 54 was something that I am really proud of. Um, and SB 54 is sitting on the governor's desk. This would make California a sanctuary state. Um, that's a huge step for Californians. And it does a lot to make sure that um, we have additional protections from those kind of criminal consequences that immigrants um, particularly face. So again, this, this is pretty amazing. Thank you. And as we speak about um, keeping our community safe, we want to remind you and we want to invite you today. We are doing, an SRGC is going to be doing a legal observer training. So one of the things that the North Bay Immigrant, um, 
what is it called, Norbury organizing project, excuse me, uh, being a partner of all of this, what they are doing is they are training community members, US citizens who want to be able to advocate. This is when we get a report that immigration may be in town. Uh, they will be able, if they have your information, you will be able to go and respond, observe, video record, and then interview the uh, families, uh, victims, of this uh, deportation process and be able to then share that information with attorneys so that then we can go and try and get these individuals out of custody before they are moved around throughout the, count throughout the, the country. And so this event is gonna happen today here at Santa Rosa Junior College at the Mikasa Center, which is located in Garcia Hall, and it goes from 6 p.m. until 7.30 p.m. So you're all invited to participate. I just wanted to briefly mention, I, I was an attorney doing this position in 2012 when the um, immigration reform bill was, um, was up to play. And there was a lot of opposition to that bill uh, because um, similar to what the youth here are, are saying about criminalization, um, there's a special thing called what's deportable and inadmissible crimes. It's things that can make you, if you have a green card, be taken away or if you were trying to get a green card, won't allow you. And there were things like DUIs added to that list um, so that any person who has a green card had a DUI could be, their green card could get, to get taken away. And so I would just ask, as, as someone who um, represents some of our most vulnerable communities, that when we are discussing um, immigration reform, that we also uh, look at making sure that we see those immigration consequences. It's my Sixth Amendment obligation to my clients um, to ask you to please look at that. Okay. Going, moving to a card question. We do, we do now officially have 15 minutes. I apologize about the mistake earlier. Thank you for your patience with the moderator here. Uh, uh, Congressman Thompson and Huffman, thank you for showing up. Can you provide any insight as to the effectiveness of community organizing? protests, rallies regarding DACA, women's rights, etc. Are they feeling the fire or do we need to turn up the heat, I suppose, in Washington? Well, I think the, uh, in, in Washington, we refer to those groups as the outside groups. And I think outside group participation is extremely important. Uh, not only in regard to DACA or immigration, but in regard to everything. Uh, it was outside group involvement that derailed the repeal the last time they tried to repeal the Affordable Care Act. So it's incredibly important. But if it's DACA, if it's immigration reform, if it's uh, Affordable Care Act, well, whatever it is, just make sure that it's done respectfully. That is incredibly important. You can lose a, a lot of support that you otherwise uh, have. And I'll just, as a side, I think uh, Jared will appreciate this, but when I represented the whole North Coast, uh, I represented Humboldt, Mendocino County uh, during the time of the Timber Wars. And one of the, uh, uh, one of the huge uh, uh, activists in regard to not cutting trees was a guy named Woody Harrelson, uh, you know, the, the actor. And he had a lot of support until he suspended himself from the San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge in the middle of rush hour traffic. And he lost a lot of support from his Bay Area uh, base. So it cuts both ways. Be careful how you do it. I'll uh, just echo the fact that the uh, resistance, this incredible grassroots thing that's happening around the country is absolutely uh, having an impact. You are the reason the Affordable Care Act is still the law right now. Uh, you are the reason, hopefully, we'll fight back this most recent attack against it. Uh, I believe uh, women, especially around this country, have uh, had a huge impact. The fact that all of these Republican health care repeals are trying to defund Planned Parenthood uh, has created one heck of a backlash and is uh, in no small part 
the reason why Susan Collins of Maine uh, is going to be a reliable no vote, and hopefully Lisa Murkowski will be the vote that puts a fork in it. But I think women and this resistance we're talking about is going to be the key to making that happen. Uh, the rallies and spontaneous responses we saw regarding the Muslim ban at airports uh, was th those were hugely effective. And uh, in terms of changing hearts and minds in Washington, maybe also impacting the way courts uh, took a look at this issue and made critical dispositive uh, decisions about that. And I think the same can happen with regard to DACA and hopefully other parts of comprehensive immigration reform. Um, uh, I would also like to add in, if it wasn't addressed to me, um, a lot of folks, a lot of different marginalized communities uh, started off uh, their civil rights movement as uh, a protest, right? If you look at LGBTQ movement, uh, look at Stonewall riots, uh, if you're looking at the Black Liberation Movement, look at all the marches and protests that they did, um, and even if you look at the documented folks, at immigrants, uh, look at all the protests uh, and incidents and, and walkouts that we did uh, in 2010, 2011, 2012, uh, and how that led to us getting DACA. So I've been on both sides of this equation, both fighting from the outside and now kind of sitting in the inside. And I think that one of the things that I acknowledge every day as a woman of color in the field of law in the state of California is that I stand on the shoulders of the people who stood outside of those institutions and banged on the doors and yelled and protested and died for my right to have this law license in this state. So please, don't stop fighting, don't stop banging on those doors and demanding your seat at the table because sometimes it's the only way that we get one. Great. Hello, my name is Alma Gomez Carrillo. Um, I just wanted to talk about healthcare for undocumented folk. Um, my grandma, she is undocumented, she's 67, and she's suffering from chronic heart failure. She's at the point where she's getting morphine and her health is quickly declining. And how my friend Lay pointed out that undocumented folk don't have health care in this country. So what are y'all gonna do to make sure that, it's too late for my grandma, but what are y'all gonna do to help others who are dying of diseases and illnesses? I, I just wanna tell you that you're, she does have health care. In, in this country. She has a community health clinic, for example, that will see her with no questions asked. Very restricted, but I, it does bring up an important uh, deadline that everybody needs to know about if you value community health centers and the safety net role they provide without asking about anyone's documentation status. The funding, the core funding for community health centers expires at the end of this month. It's one of the things that Congress has to get back to work on when Mike and I return next week because we've got a very limited amount of time. So we certainly would love to do more for your grandmother and others to get them access to the full array of healthcare services that, that we'd like them to have. Uh, but we've also got to fight to hang on to what we do have, uh, which is an important part of the safety net. Um, I'd also like to remind folks that like, this isn't just undocumented folks, but it's also poor communities of color, this is also poor queer trans communities that we really need to be taking care of. Hi, good afternoon. And I received a lot of support from folks like Rafael, and um, I just want to thank everyone for you know all your support, because you talked about mental health, but just having that support creates a sense of psychological safety for us. Um, I also represent, you know, the young professionals. You know, obviously, thanks to the help from junior college, I was able to move on, get my bachelor's degrees, and then my master's degrees in organizational development. Um, so I know the gentleman spoke about, you know, that untapped uh, workforce. Well, what else are you guys going to do, you know, to that, um, to reach that? Uh, workforce, you know, because there, there's a lot of us that are professionals in the community. All right. Good, Good comment. I was thinking, is this uh, just a comment? Did you?
Actually, more uh, of a question of okay. how are you going to help the young prof DACA professionals who have gotten their degrees? Well, I think a couple of people have mentioned already, uh, myself included, the value of uh, those uh, who contribute. And those with professional degrees certainly uh, are high on, on that scale. Uh, another statistic that might be interesting uh, to some of you is that um, uh, immigrants are two times as likely to start a business in the United States of America than their native-born counterparts. So uh, there's a lot of benefit in this, and, and we talk about it uh, all the time, uh, and it's one of the reasons that we're so motivated to get this mess fixed. This is really what the DREAM Act is all about, providing permanent certainty for your future, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you, you talk about business, right, yeah. uh, ask anyone in business, uh, what's the worst possible thing for business? And it's uncertainty. Mm -hmm. When you've got a program where your status expires every couple of years and you have to renew it and you're not even sure with President Trump around that that's gonna be an option, uh, there's no way that you can act on this great education that we have invested in you. And we don't get the benefit of all your skills and education. So we've got to make this permanent. That's really what it's all about. And I, I, just, I just mentioned, too, I don't think it was uh, an accident that the first organized voice against this president's uh, move to do away with DACA was the high-tech community. Uh, they came out, uh, CEOs came out uh, across the country recognizing that uh, it's going to hurt their business if, in fact, you, these young professionals, as you referenced them, uh, were going to be ripped out of their workforce. Force. Um, also, I'd like to point out to all uh, business owners, homeowners, or whomever, um, even though, like, a lot of DACA folks, even, they, even themselves, don't have uh, their own bachelor's or master's, but they still need to work, right? So I really challenge all of you to either create jobs or hire undocumented folks uh, and really help us survive and work, right? That's a really big thing that we do need because a lot of us don't know how to work as undocumented folks. So we really need y'all to step up and help us. So there have been many changes. There have been many changes between 1994 when we passed the anti-immigrant law in California, which was Prop 187, where the majority of the voters of California said we do not want undocumented immigrants. When Laith was talking, and when a couple of people said, basically, you need to stop protesting, you need to be grateful for the piecemeal that you are being thrown at, it is important that we remember that, and I say this with all due respect, and this is where I leave my Santa Rosa Junior College hat, and I'll speak as a professor at Santa Rosa Junior College, which allows me a little bit more freedom. <laughs> and this is the reality of the situation what we say on a regular basis is we must be at the table or we risk becoming part of the menu. And so the fact that we have only one undocumented immigrant youth at this table, it's a problem. There should be more people who are undocumented who get access to the mic. Why did they protest uh, Nancy Pelosi's event? Because otherwise nobody's listening. Why did the communities of color burn down Watts in the 1960s? Because nobody was listening. Why did in 1992 the communities of color burn down buildings in LA? Is because nobody was listening. Desperation takes you to take over these type of situations. Writing letters will only do so much. And then all we need to do is educate the youth and open that door so that they can be part of the dialogue, okay? And with that, it's important that we understand that we need to be advocates and that especially people who are US citizens, we do not need you to solve our problems. We need you to come, listen, and let us guide you to the solution because we know what it feels like. For somebody to say, I know what it feels like to have a parent who has been deported and your parents are US citizens, you don't know. It's as simple as that. Unless you have experienced somebody's death, you don't know what it feels like. And to say that is nothing but a slap in the face. 
it's really, really important for me as an educator that you understand that. And with that said, we invite you to come to these type of events. We invite you to come to the trainings. Do not take over that space. Be there to learn from the experts, like individuals like Leith, Hector, and several other individuals in our community. Thank you. One more question. Hi, my name is Paulina Lopez and I'm a current student here at the JC. And my question is on Betsy Devils. I'm really worried, you know, as a sick as a as the education secretary of the US that she hasn't really touched uh, you know the conversation on DACA and how as a student and as a future educator of this country, how can we urge her to take action on protecting students on DACA? And, or any other student that is uh, not protected? Well, I will promise you one thing. Betsy DeVos has no idea what DACA even is. <laughs> <laughs> so, we really got our work cut out for us with yeah. Betsy DeVos. Uh, I'm not sure she knows what public education is. She certainly doesn't know what the IDEA and Title IX and any number of other safeguards uh, even mean. Because she's an ideologue who is in this for one reason, and that is to try to repurpose public funds into private schools and ideally into religious schools. And it's an agenda that is very sinister uh, and that I know that Mike and I and our colleagues are going to be fighting against for as long as she is in this office that she is unqualified to hold. So that's about all I can yeah. tell you. She's one of the better examples in this administration uh, of the phrase, elections have consequences. Um, and, and Jarrett's right, you know, it's, it's lost in translation trying to, uh, to talk to her about this. She's there for one purpose, one purpose only, and uh, we just need to make sure that instead of agonizing over this, we organize and, uh, and make some big changes. Um, to all of my undocumented, or my fellow undocumented students here at the JC or wherever you might be, um, to those who decide to study uh, and, and be in academia, um, I want to remind y'all that DACA isn't going to affect your ability to be in school here in California. Uh, you can still apply for scholarships, you can still apply to university, you can still apply to transfer, you can still be here, right? Uh, there is AB 540 that helps you waive the um, out-of-state tuition fee if you are eligible. Unfortunately, not everyone is. However, there are scholarships here specifically at the JC MEM for undocumented students. Um, I know that Advocacy Committee is putting out uh, scholarships for undocumented folks as well as our undocumented student union and a lot of other people to help us pay for our education. Right? We want folks to be educated. And there are many other ways that undocumented immigrants can come legally to Santa Rosa Junior College or 100 of the 13 community colleges, uh, state universities. And we are happy to educate our brothers and sisters at other community colleges and universities. There are many laws in California that allow us to do this legally. Um, we are happy to do the trainings in-house. We are happy to come to your location and train you on how to do this. It is the law of California, again. From, from 1994 to 2017, it's a whole different world. SB 1159 says, even if you don't have legal status, you can go to the state, you can take your test, and you can become legally a nurse, you can become a dental hygienist, or anything else that requires a license, including attorneys. And then, what you can do, for, for those of you who are employers, what you can do, you hire these individuals as contractors or you can start your own businesses as nurses and then just hire your services. Perfectly legal in the state of California. Again, we are happy to, to teach you this, and I invite our uh, state officials and our federal uh, representatives here to, again, maybe create pamphlets or something of the kind, trainings, so that more people, specifically employers in California, know this information. Thank you. I'm has been pretty quiet, but also um, VVAS and a number of other immigration providers 
um, are also looking to do, are, are participating in different clinics. So those of you who do have DACA or do not have any other status can look to see if you have other forms of relief. I don't know if Rick would like to say anything more about that. Uh, we will be at the county initiative meetings on the 20th and the 28th and some of the other dates and we'll be happy to give uh, free consultations there. We also give consultations at our office. So if your DACA is coming to an end or you see uh, an expiration date coming up but you think you might have another option, please come in. We'll happy, be happy to explore that with you. Okay, as we move towards the end, we have uh, closing remarks, first by Congressman Huffman and then by Congressman Thompson. Uh, I'll be uh, brief and, and just thank everyone who uh, took time out of their day to be part of a very important conversation. Uh, Mike and I, as members of the United States Congress, uh, have work to do. We've got a real problem here affecting our communities, affecting our country, affecting our economy. And uh, we want to deliver for you. We want to deliver certainly uh, a DREAM Act to protect 800,000 young people who are Americans in every sense. You've heard from some of them today. Uh, the idea of deporting some of these young people with uh, the whole future ahead of them uh, is just anathema to me. It's cruel. It's self-destructive. We can't let that happen. So we may have an opportunity to do something to help them in the weeks ahead. I want to promise you that if we do, uh, and again, we've got a very unreliable negotiating partner in Donald Trump. But if we do, and if we can do it on our terms, the terms of good policy, where we're not trading off a deportation force or a crazy border wall or something like that, then we want to do that, and we want to be clear that we're going to keep working on all 11 million through comprehensive immigration reform as we go forward as well. So I appreciate very much this uh, respectful, thoughtful dialogue. And you have uh, my commitment to work as hard as I can for as long as it takes to get this done. I'll be even briefer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I look forward to working with Jared on this issue and the many issues that impact all of us here today. They're so important to our country and our way of life. And we will work extremely hard and make sure that your interests and your values are represented in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Because this issue most affects undocumented people, I want to invite Alay to give a closing remark as well. Um, hi everyone, thank you all for coming, especially to my undocumented fam uh, who is here, who is present. Um, I, I see y'all and I appreciate all of you. Um, and to other folks, uh, feel free to come up to me, ask any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you. All right. I hope this is the first of many conversations we have uh, on this issue and many others that impact uh, our community, our, our country, our world. Um, please, I really encourage students to come up and talk to the panelists, to talk to professors here on campus. The most important thing is to get involved, get involved in campus clubs. I think that's going to be the biggest thing that helps promote kind of community health and community mental well-being. So Metro meets on Mondays at 6 to 7 uh, in the Center for Student Leadership. The Undocumented Student meets at 3 o'clock, which is right now upstairs. Uh, and next to EOPS, uh, there's Feminist United, there's Mujeres Singonas, there are so many different student clubs to be involved in, and there's so many campus and, and, and community organizations to be on. Volunteer for one of these town hall workshops that's going on on Saturdays, volunteer for one of the county meetings. If you can't do that, donate money. The Undocumented Student Union has a, has a foundation account here at Santa Rosa Junior College. It's even tax deductible. So donate money. Get involved any way that you can. This is an urgent issue. Get involved in um, ally training so that you can be a legal observer. Any way that you can get involved, please do so. If you want more information, come up and talk to us. Thank you for attending, and please have a good day. <laughs>